Shocking, perhaps hard to believe, but children of five and under make up half of the workforce in some of Madagascar's mineral mines, digging raw materials for use in makeup, in car paint and other goods. Many of us, well, we boycott products tested on animals. What about child labour? Are we all complicit? We're watching round tape. Hello for me, David Foster. You may well have seen the cosmetics with stickers on them proclaiming not tested on animals. But is it time for a similar promise about the use of child workers? Child labour has existed throughout history. In today's global market, tobacco, coffee, cotton and gold are just some of the industries reliant on child workers. According to the International Labour Organization, 152 million children are victims of child labour. It's usually defined as work that deprives them of their childhood and is harmful to physical and mental development. Most child labour happens in agriculture, livestock herding, subsistence and commercial farming and fishing. But in India and Madagascar, children are used to mine the mineral mica. It's an ingredient in countless items from paints to cosmetics, from cars to laptops. Many products have labels that say free trade or not tested on animals. But can the things we buy ever be child labor free? All right, let us welcome from Geneva, Benjamin Smith, child labor expert for the International Labor Organization from Berlin, the journalist Marius Munstermann, who's reported on child labor in different countries around the world. With me in the studio, Claire Van Beckham, project manager of the MICA project at the child's rights group Terre des Hommes, and Colleen Terran, chief executive of Ardea International, which advises companies about human rights. And Colleen, we'll, we'll talk about how companies want to get it right and how they can easily be hoodwinked, uh, and you try to prevent that a little bit later on. But Ben, let me go to you first of all. International Labour Organization's own figures. The year 2000, 16% um, of the workforce, 245 million children in work. 2016, latest figures, 72 million. So it's gone from 16%, sorry, it's gone from 11% down to 4% when it comes to hazardous work. And when it comes from just child labour, 16% down to 9%. It's getting better. It is getting better, David, but the bad news is that it's not dropping fast enough we still have 152 million children in child labor today. And as you know, about half of those children are in hazardous work, uh, working in mines, spraying pesticides, putting their health and safety at risk. So it's an urgent problem still, uh, and we need to pick up the pace. And the youngest appear to be most at risk. The age profile of five to 11 year old makes up 48% of the 150 million children who, who are working? Why the youngest? Well, most of those children actually are working in agriculture. Uh, about two thirds of child labor is in the family context. So the notion of a, a evil employer uh, sort of enslaving children is, is not uh, the, the reality. Most children are working alongside their mom, their mother and father as a result of household poverty, oftentimes on family farms, where at harvest time to make end meet, ends meet, uh, the children are, are mm. brought in to work. So and it's not so, necessarily exploitation, it is sometimes a matter of simple survival. That's correct. No parent wants to put their child to, into uh, hazardous child labor by any means. They're obliged to do it because of their circumstances. Okay, Claire, Claire the MICA project, it, it, it is about a material that's found, I mean, in Madagascar, it's found in other countries, as well used in cosmetics, what yeah. makes sparkly makeup, yeah. it's used in cars, planes, um, it's found in India as well. These aren't agricultural workers, these are child miners carrying heavy loads, digging down, and one of the reasons I read that they, they are chosen at such a young age is because they have small hands, that they can get them into tiny crevasses. Yes, but again, I also need to agree with Benjamin. It's also because 
family income needs to be provided. And also that for most of these families, which is very remote area, schooling is not available. Schools are not there. There are no teachers. <coughs> is there even a school? So sometimes it's also because of the context that they're actually living mm. in that they are needed to help and join with, again, the family effort. Nevertheless, mm. they are there. They are very yes. young. They are being, whether mm. it's survival yes. or exploitation or perhaps mm. a little bit of both, uh, they are putting themselves at at risk and the smallest are chosen because they are the best size for these ridiculously dangerous but fiddly jobs yes i mean their hands are indeed they're small they can do the cobbing very easily of the mica which is uh, being done by by children from a very young age already on okay marius let me come to you and i, I will ask you about how do you avoid using companies that um, are exploiting children in, in just a moment but marius you, you've been to the philippines you've been to cambodia uh, you've done uh, documentaries on, on, on mica mining uh, in, in Madagascar. What, what did you see? So I can, I can just agree to what the other two just mentioned. It's, it's basically the context of general poverty. In India, we went to the two states of Jharkhand and Bihar, two of the most impoverished regions of all India. And it's basically children joining their parents and their elder siblings to go to those mines. And when we talk about mines, it's not what you would imagine to be a mine maybe in, in other countries or in, in other industries. So it's basically holes dug into the ground. So whenever people find a mica depot, they would just keep digging deeper and until they don't find anything. Were you shocked at what you saw? Well, we prepared our research there, so we knew kind of what to expect. But it's a different experience once you enter one of those mines, once you, you know, go down into one of those tunnels and see what it's actually like when the earth is shaking with every strike of the hammer. And you know that people lose their lives in those tunnels, not on a daily basis, but there are just people guessing those figures and trying to document it, but people die in those tunnels hundreds of people every year. You see, the thing is, um, we've started off this program by basically saying it's circumstance that these children drift in, into this. Uh, and yet, looking at some of the photographs I've seen that accompanied uh, various articles, that there are gang bosses um, making young children do things that they don't particularly want to do, uh, carry heavy rocks, go, go underground, etc., etc. And, and you yourself, Marius, I understand, felt that you were in some danger when you were doing some of this filming, getting to the heart of the story. Well, to get into those mines in India, in that area, in some cases involves going to territories where there is no government control. There's a Maoist rebellion group called the Naxalites. So that already tells you something about this situation of that mining industry, which is highly illicit and illegal. So there's no government control. And once you get into the mines, you, you, you sense that people are not at ease. They don't want any reporters there. They, we didn't show our cameras, obviously, in the first place. And it's difficult to find people who will be willing to talk to you because they know they are involved in something illegal. OK. Um, Colleen, I keep saying I'll come to you in just a moment. But I've got one more question for Ben, if I may. How did you get it down from, and, from 245 million to 150 million in, over the course of 16 years? What was successful? Well, government action is critical. So economic growth is important, David, but it's not sufficient. In fact, uh, most of child labor is occurs in middle income countries. So what did governments do? Invested in inclusive education, uh, social protection, and this can mean cash transfers actually to uh, poor families to make sure that they can afford schooling. Uh, rule of law, uh, and that means ratifying ILO conventions on child labor, uh, putting those into national legislation, and then implementing national action plans against child labor. And then finally, decent work for parents. We've talked, and I agree with the, the other guests, that it is a question of poverty, and so you need to have parents earning a decent income so that they can send their children to school uh, and keep them out of, of child labor. So it's that policy yeah. mix that has made uh, a critical difference, um, 
perhaps even more so than economic growth, uh, in fact. So we have arrived in this program at, at a point where we've established that the, there is still a major problem. The problem is not as big as it used to be, that there needs to be some kind of international framework that people are more aware of what is going on. Mm -hmm. Now, your company, Ardea, in Ardea International, will look at the chain, won't it? It'll yes. take a look at what is happening in, in that mine in eastern India, and it will work all the way back to the purchaser and advise people on what is ethical and what isn't. Am I, am I right in summarising that? I, I think um, there's two things. I think one, one point I just wanted to make, picking up from um, <coughs> what Benjamin had said, is I think that one has to really look at this holistically as a, as a problem in the sense that um, government has to have its role in ensuring that legislation that is put in place is effective and enforced, but that within that there is a duty on business and companies on how they are going to respect human rights. And we've seen that with the growth of um, frameworks like the United Nations Guiding Principles, which establishes that duty that companies have a duty to respect human rights so what we would do is in the first instance working with businesses is getting first of all for them to understand what their commitment is because a lot of this as to why we don't see change happening in supply chains is because there isn't a commitment at the top that says we want to do the right thing notwithstanding legislation being enforced or not enforced, we actually want to do the right thing. So one of the first things we would do is try and get a corporation to make a commitment from its leadership, from its CEO downwards to say, we want to do the right thing and to make that a policy commitment and then start working on what we call due diligence procedures that putting in place all the right processes to be able to map that supply chain. Well, one assumes that a company would come to you because it does have that idea of wanting to do the right thing at, at the very top. Or perhaps it's just about sort of making sure they keep a loyal customer base to keep their profits up. But how do you then go about, because there are so many links in the chain, making yeah. sure each one of those is whiter than white. Well, it's not always possible to make sure everything's whiter than white, and it depends where, you, where you're working from, because so interestingly, sometimes people from an operational level will come to us, not necessarily from the CEO level, because the operational people are the ones that are grappling with the issues and grappling with the potential um, uh, dichotomy of, you know, what's happening from a customer and consumer viewpoint and from a reputation viewpoint and actually what they're doing. So. Mm. What we would do is we would just we would start by literally looking at their relationships and what they do in their tiers, and then we have to work down that. And that's not always possible. Some organisations will just go to tier mm. one. They, and would say you they be can't able to tell anything. me, Chief Executive of David Foster International, who wants to make um, some kind of makeup, that I must not go to this particular mine to get my material because it employs children? On the other hand, you could go to that one over there because it's squeaky clean. We, I mean, you know, unless you have... So you don't really know? No, most people don't. And what people are... Unless you are within a sector and you actually have had the opportunity to go and see where those places are on the ground, then you might be able to say, well, that mine looks better than that mine. And people have networks, so you will you know, speak to journalists, speak to, look at ILO information, look at what's going on from a political risk point of yeah. view. But actually getting to the bottom is not always that This easy. is the difficulty, isn't it? We've yeah. arrived at the fact that it's social circumstances that perhaps push children into this and their yeah. parents uh, are unable to stop them because they need to, to survive as a family mm -hmm. unit. But you don't know, Ben, you don't know, Marius, you don't know, none of us here would be able to spot the bad guys. Well, that's not entirely true, because I think that they... Uh, do yeah. you going to no, agree I here? Say, I, think that I you, agree. We do know. We I do think know. In, in general we, yeah. can, we can identify some industries that are very much um, in, in, in the position to, to change um, okay, their... OK, start, start here. To tell us all. Well, for example, I think uh, we've, we've um, already named the makeup industry when it comes to uh, mica. I think the makeup industry started 
at least 10 years ago already on this issue and really trying to, to take the, the necessary steps and, and, and form a, a group. I'm not so much talking so, about a, a customer. I'm talking about no, somebody but this who's is working actually, in the business. You know, uh, when it came to the body shop, they decided that they would only have ethical when it came to animal testing. I, I'm not so sure about child labour. I don't know how they went into that. But how would you, as a company, try to source your products now? Well, I think you first need to do your due diligence and have at least your, your supply chain mapped mm. so that you can actually identify where your gaps of knowledge are yeah. in these supply chain and see whether you can fill those gaps. And if you identify potential risk of child labor in your supply chain, yeah. that needs that you, you need to take action. Yes. And and I think and you're learning all the time how how you can identify. Yeah, absolutely. These because I mean, you know, we're talking, you know, globally this is definitely not a problem that's going away very easily. And oh. and I think that um <clears throat> as well, you know, you have issues of trafficking, you have issues of modern slavery, bonded labor, all these kind of mm. things that sit on top of this as well. And at the heart of that is people making money. So, you know, people will move where there's money and where there's opportunity. So, you know, it is something that you have to keep an eye on, you know, trends, information from NGOs, information from journalists, information from, you know, data gathering organisations. There's more and more of them that are making information available. But as Claire said, you know, what's really key is working with a company that in the first instance actually wants to ask the questions because I think, you know, part of the problem around um, business is that, uh, and actually there's a report that um, ILO was part of, the Alliance 8.7 report, it came out last this week. This last month, yeah. Yeah, this last week, actually. Yeah. And, you know, it has different figures around child labour. Um, and But what is really interesting in there is, is they specifically call out that companies are aware they need to do due diligence, but they don't implement it. And that is oh, so what they're saying the, crux the right is. things, but not doing the right. And that is, yeah. and that is the crux of this. That is why, you know, business needs to get a hold of actually how yeah. they implement. Okay, uh, Marius, I will come to you in a moment because I want to ask you about some of the particular things that you've seen. But, but Ben, let's go back to last week's report, November's report on on this and the idea of a, either a company or a customer being able to identify whether child labour is involved in anything is one of your. Conclusions that things need to be labelled better, that it needs to say as it did with makeup, uh, not tested on animals. This needs to say not made using child labour. Is there any way of doing that, or is that supposed to happen already and doesn't? Uh, well, I don't think labelling is the answer uh, because it's very hard to prove definitively that uh, a given product, whether it's the chocolate we're eating, makeup, the paint used on our car, uh, is actually free of child labor. So that would be a, a risky proposition to put a, a label like that on a product. What you can look at is what a company is doing uh, in terms of uh, uh, its due diligence, mapping its supply chain, trying to understand where child labor risks might be. I think the, the big challenge for business is that those companies that are looking at this problem uh, tend to stop only at the first tier, like where they have a direct uh, contractual nice. relationship with their business. But most child labor, and this comes from our report that we launched last week, is actually much deeper in the supply chain. Uh, so there you have less visibility, uh, it's harder to come up with a response oh. because you have less leverage. But that doesn't mean that you can hide your head in the sand and ignore it because uh, that responsibility to take action is there regardless of where the child labor is occurring along the supply chain. Yeah, I mean, the numbers are extraordinary, whether they've come down or not. And it's not easy to get to, but it's pretty obvious when you do that children are being exploited. It is quite difficult for companies that so they, mm. they tend to say that they don't know where it's actually coming from. I think then again, what Benjamin explained, that you really need to look beyond tier one. Yeah. Um, and I do think that they're able to track more of their supply chain uh, as, as, we, as we also, mm. as Ter de Zom identified, uh, from Madagascar back to China and via China to Japan or US. So you can actually, I mean, but it, it takes time, it takes effort, and it's also... But the customer can't do this, can they? No, and I don't think this is actually yeah. the responsibility when it, for example, comes to MICA with the customer. This is really 
up mm. to okay. the companies to address mm. um, because it's very difficult. It's, it's about very small mm. quantities, um, but it's very widespread when it comes yeah. to, to the mica mineral. We're talking about uh, very small children up to the age of five. We're talking about um, a diminishing uh, workforce after that because for whatever reason, maybe they want more money, maybe they move away, maybe they can't fit into the small holes in the ground that they have to go into. So what happens to these people once they outgrow their usefulness? Well, in India, in those two states we visited, they still need it afterwards. So they work together with men in the in the tunnels to dig the mica to bring it up to the to mm. the surface, and then later on they sit with elder men and women and sort the mica and scrap it. So the, anyone can work in those mines. It, it, it's it's a life place. sentence, though, is it? Mm. It's something that people work mm. in, kind of traditionally, you could say, in in many generations already. Mm. Colleen, you're nodding your head. No, I, I think that's right. I think that um, the problem around this is, is that it becomes generational as well because people are caught in a cycle of poverty and lack of education and lack of ability to get out. And that is, you know, when you look at the report, particularly the one I was referring to that came out last week as well, you know, um, really highlighting the fact that something has to happen that breaks that generational um, sort of lack of education and poverty. And, and, and in reality, you know, when we look at um, the power of business in, across the globe, that is why I think there's been such an emphasis on a duty placed on them to respect human rights, because in many cases they do have the power if they had the will to really make a change. And, and I think what is interesting is when you look at components in manufacture, very often if there's a quality issue, it can be found very quickly where that went wrong. So, so some businesses will say they can't map their supply mm. chain, but when there's a quality issue, they can find out very quickly where that issue went wrong. So it's a, it's a matter of, <coughs> in some cases, a matter of will. I'm, I'm it's not, not just mica, is it? I mean, Ben, I'll no. throw this one at you, but anybody can come in. It, it's not just mica, it, it's a multitude of different products. Reading about cobalt mining in the mm. um, Democratic Republic of Congo not very long ago. How are you going to get a handle on all of this when the demand for these products is going through the roof? Ben? Well, absolutely. It is uh, uh, across all sectors uh, a challenge to, to address child labor in the supply chain. Our report uh, uh, showed that in global supply chains, uh, anywhere from 9% to 26% of the child labor problem is actually occurring in global supply chains, uh, then alone domestic supply chains. And that's the other uh, side that doesn't get as much media attention, perhaps, but is, it is also important, just pr production for uh, local economies. Uh, and so I think that that uh, whether it's, you know, the cell phones that we use or uh, the, the meat and produce in our our uh, grocery store, it's important as consumers that we uh, ask what is uh, the the origin of the products that we're consuming, because that gives a signal to companies and can kind of incentivize them to uh, do their the, the, uh, meet their responsibilities in that regard. Just to talk also uh, with your friends, with your colleagues, children speaking to each other at school. I think there's a huge uh, uh, potential in, in you know, children's participation and voicing mm. their concern mm. about these issues. Much okay, so everybody that. needs to develop a conscience right, right down to the very youngest, but that isn't necessarily yeah. going to stop it. How, how do you stop it? Well, I think this is um, not an easy answer to that. I think that, and that's, that's the whole point, you need to work together. So not only with companies, with government, but also NGOs need to team up on these uh, issues. Um, but also, don't forget communities and, and parents. I mean, we ask for children to raise their voices and to claim their mm -hmm. rights, but in initially, that's are actually the parents' job to do. Uh, yeah, I, as well. but on the other hand, are we, the developed world, the consumer world, more guilty of exploiting these children than perhaps their parents are because they have to do so to get bread and food?
food on the table, bread and water on the table. Yes, but on the other hand, if we stop uh, buying products with um, the goods that they are actually working on, but we will says take that they, the... They, they, labeling's not the answer. If I saw something that said made with no. child labor on it, well, then nobody's going to put that on in the first place. But if I knew... No. And I think just banning these sort of products or minerals, etc., that's for sure not the answer. I think for companies to invest actually not only in their supply chain, but also very much on community level or where they're sourcing, where they're buying from. I mean, if you know that... We've had everything on the cheap for far too long. We've got to yeah, change rather than the so. practices change out there. Yes, just so to it's... Add to that... Mm -hmm. Yeah, quick. I think essentially it's it's about money, paying workers decent money so that they don't have to take their kids to that mine. That's essentially why they bring them because they don't make enough money themselves to su to supply their families. Okay. But well, not look, in a all practical cases. lesson as well as a moral but lesson. In well the case of micro in India. Yeah. yeah. I got to leave it there. Listen, thank you very okay. much indeed. I know there was so much more that everybody wanted to say. As I said, um, a practical lesson as well as a moral lesson. Quite difficult to see how it can be stopped, but the numbers are encouraging. Thanks. Listen, thank you, Ben. Thank you, Marius. Good to have you two in the studio. Bye. Long thank journey you. over from Holland and very patient with it. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you. Uh, for me, David Foster from the Roundtable team, thank you uh, for watching. We hope we have brought to your attention something that uh, in many ways is appalling, but in some ways is unavoidable. The horrors of child labour. Thank you. Hope to have your company next time. Goodbye for now.